My name is uh, Leo Hearn uh, from Pity Harbor, uh, Newfoundland, and I've been here 60 years anyhow. <laughs> but my family's here about over 200. My family uh, were all fish harvesters. Back in that time they were fishermen. Uh, I became a fisherman because I wanted to follow the lead of my dad, of course. We had a, a long history of fish harvesters or fishermen and uh, we made a good career but my dad fished for 50 years or longer he's fought or fished for over 50 years i think he was like 87 when he stopped and uh, i fished for 25 years and then we had a moratorium but yeah we, we spent a lot of time on the water and, and caught a lot of fish <laughs> and a lot of hard work like every everybody chipped in together like you know uh, everybody worked together kids cut out the cod tongues and so it was a family thing going down. Get the codfish, first thing we do was bleed it. Uh, we break their break their, their gills, or we just cut the throat, but we break the gills is easier. And that bleeds out the fish, so it makes the fill it all nice and white. So then when we come back to shore, take our fish, bring them up, put it on the table, and we take the first cut is across their head there, then it's go down the spine, shove the knife through halfway down, and continue on down. And then you take, turn your knife and you go the opposite way and you just tear the fill back cut it off. That's one fillet. Then you turn the fish over. You make the same cut but you start on the other end. Cut right up through and you turn your knife and you go down and cut the opposite way. That's your fillets are off. Then you skin it. So you take the knife, you cut the tail part and you run the knife closely down and take the skin off. So then you got all this waste in this true way. Like uh, nobody ever kept the cod cheeks, only the cod tongues. Uh, nobody kept the napes, all right? Now everybody's starting to see, like, oh, look all this waste that's on the fish. That's perfectly good to eat, right? And, uh, and the frame of the fish, you can make fish stock. We even use the cod skins and we draw them and we make dog treats. Uh, we get the bridgings, we get the sounds, uh, we get the napes. Napes are really good, like uh, really tasty. Nice part of the fish is the collarbone on the fish, right? So when you make your fillet, that's left on it. So you got your head, your napes, and and uh, your sound, right? Which is normally true down through right? once the canton comes out, right? So we uh, we started getting into uh, breaking down all these parts and use them. They're called odlets. You take them and you make jewelry out of it, like our little necklace or earrings or whatever, right? Uh, myself and Kimberly started just business fishing for success and it is a great success actually it's uh, we're very proud of what we're doing and it's uh, sort of back to where I, I wanted to be <laughs> right. uh, we want to get every kid that we can to go on the water and not to be a fisherman or a fish harvester just have the connection of being on the water it might be so that they want to work with the Coast Guard, or you might be a marine biologist, whatever. But have that connection, like like we grew up with. It's going to be lost if, if we don't show people and give our young kids the opportunity to see what it's about. You know, the kids are kids ha haven't got hands-on stuff like with outdoors. Like, and they're, there's a big part of their life where they should be have hands-on. They should have access to getting down by the water. You know. How do you learn? It gives them a connection. Like some of them says, "Oh, I, my my grandfather used to do that, or my aunt used to do that, or my father's parents worked in the fishery." So, kind of brings back a connection to, them. gives them the, the opportunity to, to know about their culture. You first, my beautiful wife. <laughs> We've been married for forty years this year. We grew up in Port Blanford and we live in Port Blanford now. This garden that we're filming in today is the garden that I grew up in. Where my house stands today used to be one of my father's potato gardens. And uh, before my father passed away, Gary promised them that he would always keep this green. <laughs> yeah. So it's green. It's green. And get greener. We, we do our best to, uh, to make him proud. 
This is my tea. I put uh, seaweed in a kettle in a bag and I fill it up a barrel and I use this for fertilizer. Like sometimes I might use 20, 20, 20, but I use this mostly. This is it smells a little bit by a lot of non beautiful, beautiful for your garden. It makes your garden really rich and green. As you can see, this is what I use mostly. This is a mixture of 50% ba flour and 50% baking soda. And you you get slugs in that on your vegetables. You get a shaker and a bit finer than that. And just put a dust over your vegetables. And the flour sticks the baking soda onto the vegetables. And it stops the slugs and the and or whatever the the insects from eating your uh, leaves. This is a real cheap system. You put your cabbage in, and make sure you get lots of uh, lime. I use in all my small seed. I use pellet lime. There's a formula for doing it, but I just put in what I think you know is right. When you start off your cabbage, you put this over, and the flies and everything can't uh, can't get at it. But a friend of mine showed me this. 9 volt battery and rabbit wire and you go right around your raised bed like you go to positive to negative and the slug will uh, come up and you touch the two wires it won't kill them but uh, it'll, it'll turn them around and go back down. We are the generation now that's yeah. able to do this and enjoy it mm -hmm. and it's good that we're able to teach the younger people or talk to the younger people and just let them know what we do for to make ours as successful as what they are. Like it seems a marriage, if you take something from a marriage or from your garden, you got to put something back into it. Like if you take out potatoes and beets and everything else, if you take it for yourself and don't help your garden, next year your garden's not going to help you. Like today I went and picked out some potatoes and that. You and your hand in the dirt, my hands are not very clean now, but my hands in the dirt. And you take pro because you grew that. You worked at that yourself. No one ever gave that to you. You worked at that. You, you grew that. I had cancer, and I seen stuff that had a bug of your mind, like people with cancer. And I used to come in my garden and sit down in chairs, eat, eat with flowers, I mean, but watch things grow. So anybody that comes in my garden. Or our garden, don't go away empty handed. Information or vegetables or friendship or whatever. That's what we're about. I grew up in Nadi Bay, a little community six kilometers from here. I grew up here. In St. Lanier. We met in um, 65 and we got married in April of uh, 66. The first one we got married, we were married two years before electricity came here. Oh, we didn't have no fridges or anything then to put things in. We always bought our jam and we always put pear wax on top to keep it from spiling. You know, that would keep it from going bad on top. And that's how we did the bottling of that then, you know, until electricity came here. Both of us worked on a fish plant. First when we got married, we used to fish, right? Money wasn't very plentiful. You know, we was, was only getting small pay at, at our work. See, back here you lived off the land. That's all we lived off the land. There wasn't, you didn't have any money because you didn't need it. See, so no light bills, no phone bills, no cars. So you, had, you didn't need money. And we had all those stuff, you know, all of those uh, things preserved, right? When you come home from work and that, you know, instead of come home cooking the meal, which is days we didn't have time to do, we open up something, probably open up a bottle of mousse or thing, and put it on the stove and add a lot, make some gravy, and boil a few potatoes and carrots and that, and there you had your meal for, for supper. It was really important for, the fa you know, for us family, right? Beets and the carrot and stuff like that, right? That often was from our own garden. We used to set potatoes, we'd kill up from the beach and then when the cape on land we'd put a cape on top and that was the fertilizer we used eh? We gave a lot of our stuff away to people who didn't have things. We would share our bottling and our veggies. Say if someone came in unexpected and you was after finishing your, your lunch or whatever we had hours to eat, 
Well, they came in, you open up a bottle of Kerbo or Rabbit and, you know, whatever, right? Moose or whatever, whatever they, they desire. We just do that and quick, quick meal, you know? We're going to start off by making some beets. We got five pound of beets. First of all, uh, they got to be boiled uh, and we just go by the tenderness. And then when they're done enough, we'll throw them in the sink there and uh, we'll just run some cold water over them. And as soon as the cold water is up, as soon as they're cold to the touch, we'll just take our, with our finger and thumb and just peel the beets like that. Huh? And now sometimes if you don't cook them enough, they won't peel like that. And then I'll cut them up. Some people want some very fancy, but I don't do that. I just cut them up chunks. And after I get some cut up, I'll do the juices, I'll say. The way I does mine, I use two, two, and two. I use two vinegar, two sugar, and two water. That's cups. And I'll add allspice. That's what I put in mine, just allspice and salt. With the whole spice, two spoons, teaspoons, and I'll taste it. If that's not enough, I'll add more. Right on. And then when we get that done, I'll bring it to a boil, and then I'll um, put the beets back in the pot, and I'll just let them come up to a boil, right? And then we'll put them in the bottle, and they're sealed. If that's not sealed, you know, that's going to spoil. Oh, yeah. Or see. Yeah, make sure the bottle is sealed. Yeah, because yeah. when you're doing it like that, Every on the bot on the bottles when they're put in red hot like that, the bottle goes down, you know, the cover, let you know, it go, let down, it go down, down in the middle, right? Yeah. And they'll click and you know it's down. But if that don't happen, the bottle's not sealed. Might as well take them back. We always leave it right there for a while. We know the lid don't go down. We'll uh, we want you know, we'll open it up right away. You know, see we we'll, we want we want to put it back. So I don't like bottle beats, I like my home. I like the ones that I do myself. Yeah. I love beach, so. I grew up in a little town called Stag Harbor on Fogo Island. Then I came to this area, like, well, I actually went to Beaumont, where I met Lou, my husband. I grew up in Long Island. And then we moved here. But we only moved there for the short term. So 50 years later, we're still here, like we built a house and had our family, and this is home now. Today, we will be looking at raspberries, and we'll be picking a few raspberries and showing how I preserve them to last over the winter. We've been gardening for a long time, but we started really small. Like first, we actually did some in containers. Every year, we'd expand our little patch and we just kept trying different stuff. Potatoes, carrots, beets, peas, herbs, strawberries, along with the raspberries. We, we grow our own raspberries, but we also pick wild raspberries. Some years I get lots from my own little patch. Last year I got well over 10 gallons, but this year I won't get half that many, not even quarter. The raspberries grow on the same branch one year, like the branch will grow one year and there will be fruit on it the next and then it dies and there's new ones. So there's not many this year that uh, have fruit on them, but it looks like there's going to be lots next year. See, this is a really nice one. It's all right when you touch it when it comes off easy, you know it's right. This has been my lifelong dream to have my own berry patch. All right, so line a tray with parchment paper. And the parchment paper works really well because they don't stick to it. So I just throw them all out and pick out any dirt that's in them. And I think they're good. So then I just put them on the tray and put them in the freezer. So here are the frozen berries. When you use the parchment paper, it uh, just, this tray is a little big, but kind of just lift them up. Just, they all just pour into the bucket. You can use any plastic container, but I like to use the beef buckets, but everybody wouldn't have those, so any plastic, plastic container will work. See? 
after fighting with the raspberries in plastic bags and like they're all in this big lump and like you can't separate them, you have to thaw them first. And I thought, there has to be a better way. A couple of years ago, I decided to try freezing them on trays. And I won't go back to stuffing them in bags anymore. <laughs> I used to cook jam, but I never cook jam anymore. I always make freezer jam. I find the flavor is like the fresh berries. All right, this is raspberry freezer jam. You mash four cups, like mash until you get four cups of mashed berries. That will probably get you about six jars of jam. A cup and a half sugar to four cups of berries. And then you mix the sugar and freezer jam pectin. Just kind of mix this up a little bit. It uh, makes it like kind of get thick, thicker. Like it's not runny. I think that should be good. You just pour this in and you stir it for three minutes. 11.57. See, it's getting paper already but uh, after I put it in the jars I sit it in the fridge overnight before I put it in the freezer. And it gets really nice and thick then. I've been making freezer jam for as long as I can remember. Three minutes is done. Then you just ladle it into jars and from this will probably be about six jars. Well, I think it's important to to keep for people to keep growing food because you get something that's not all loaded with chemicals and stuff something that's better for you it's economical too to uh, grow your own food especially like if people are on lower incomes even on a small scale like we get a we can get enough potatoes from there for most of the winter it's hard work it's not hard work if you enjoy it but it's no good to put it in the ground and say, well, I will harvest that in the fall. It don't work, so <laughs> you got to work at it. We'll pick out the weeds. And picking out weeds is not an easy job. <laughs> it's, it's, it's something that should be passed on. And uh, it's rewarding. We live good. I came to Gander in 1959 with my husband, who came to teach Latin believe it or not, in the high school. And I came to teach grade six. I spent half my life on the farm, which is a place called Wall Cove, which is halfway between Morton's Harbor and Tizard's Harbor. It didn't give us any amount of money, and I mean cash. We had a good, good living, like we had cows and pigs, and uh, in a couple of horses. Uh, the ho one horse was used for work, the other two were ponies that belonged to my brother and I. There was little money to be had. It sort of came through osmosis. I saw it, you know, uh, all the time. My mother working in the garden, my father. He learnt, and my mother learnt from, from my grandfather, uh, how they uh, planted the potatoes. So they would keep the seed, and when they would dig them in the fall, the potatoes, they'd be sorted. And the nicest little potatoes that would be about that size, with nice shapes and a number of eyes, I need one of the potatoes. So about this size, they would keep them, or a little smaller, but not too small, not like half of that. Make sure it's solid, not soft, because they, they would all wrinkled like this fellow's skin because he's old he's over this one is past his time and you look at them and of course as time went on and the number of times you did this you knew you could look at them and my grandfather would look down without a glance and without any glasses he could see how many eyes so these indentations that you see here are eyes and you need the, the rule is you need at least two at least two because one may not you know but I uh, sometimes look for three or four and they will sprout new this is what they will sprout and that's a different colored potato so these will be kept faithfully kept in a root cellar and carefully looked after that the rats didn't eat them because that was their food for next year 
Now, there's an area of thought today, and I've been told this, that you don't do it because it weakens the stock. Well, I am using the same seed out there in my little potato patch, the same seed that I brought with me to Gander in 1964. So, personally, from my personal experience, it does not weaken the seed. This is my potato that I'm going to plant, and you can see that, as I talked about before, we have three eyes. One, two, three. So now I'm going to cut it in two, and I'll make two seeds from this plant. But, just to be on the safe side, I'm not going to plant that one, because why? It only has one. So, I would dig my trusty hole in the ground about three to four inches deep, add some fertilizer. You could use commercial fertilizer or you could use manure or kelp. So you plant it in, eyes up, cover them up, and leave them be. Three weeks later, you will see those little eyes come through the ground. And that'll be your potato for next year. This one goes into your compost to be recycled into soil. And they can almost grow anywhere. I have a compost in which my scraps, potato scraps, will go in, the peelings will go into it. And I've actually seen potatoes growing in, in my compost. They're actually growing with stocks that high. Just from a potato peeling. So they're pretty resilient. When I started to do seriously, it was 1979. We bought a house in Eastport, and it had a half acre of land with it. And I love to garden, I must say. I love, I love to grow flowers, and I love to see things grow. My husband made a bin in which he insulated it and lined it with cardboard. And that's where I keep my potatoes. And when it gets really, really cold night, I have a light bulb. And a 60-watt light bulb will keep it just at the temperature because they need to be kept at just below freezing. Otherwise, they become seed too early and you don't want them to become seed until at least May because you can't plant a new land until June. If you've got a, a back lawn, dig up a small square, like uh, 24 by 24. It, that's inches. I don't deal centimeters before my time. And uh, uh, try potatoes because they're easy to grow you will have to buy your seed because you don't have the advantage of that. Or maybe you might find some old biddy like me who will give you their seed, you know, that they had. And, and try it and see how, what you think of them. And start there and see if you like, number one, what comes out of it. If you get some pleasure out of doing it, and it also provides you with a lot of exercise. That would be my tip to, to younger people starting. And I think we're on a day, we're on a very slippery slope here of processed food. We've got the highest rates of diabetes uh, of any province in Canada. We've got the highest rates of obesity. And we're killing ourselves. So I really think that's a message. That even if you did it on a little scale, it takes a bit of elbow grease. Uh, and it takes exercise. But if you, if you enjoy it, not everybody will enjoy it. But there'll be some. And I think the quicker the better. Well, I was a fisherman. I fished all my life, up to a 60-year-old. And well, when I retired from fishing, I I got the ground put there, eh, by a truck, made work for myself. I like that, that out around doing things, eh? Get a dose and. Like I say, I don't be in those very much to me dinner and supper. You have to go while you can. I'll go on, onion, uh, beets, carrot, lettuce, and cucumber. We well, keep them over in the cellar, we call it, root cellar. Better to have it in a root cellar, it's cool, eh? Down in the ground. Cool. I knew about that. All my life. My grandfather had one, my father had one. Well, at first of all, I poured flooring with concrete, eh? Then I got some, 
Well, second-hand building blocks. So you do your basement with, or and I put them around. Then I went and cut some logs and went to a sawmill, got it sawed, and put the house on top. That's about 15 years ago. My father had his down under the house, eh, because he had never had need a basement. My house, our house, was built on a lot of big rocks. That's the only place they'd build back then, because they want, they want their uh, gardens for hay. See, they had a lot of, they had cows, they had sheep, they had horses. So the worst piece of land they had to build a house on it. Like rocky land, I think it keeps the, the the food better. I can remember when they used to go moose hunting. They back, well, I was only probably four or five year old. They would do wait in the fall around Christmas or before when you get the cold weather, and they'd get their moose and they'd hang their quarter meat out in their shed, and it wouldn't be frozen in the fridge be naturally froze and better meat. Not only won't freeze in the root cellar, right? That's insulating down the ground, it's warm down in the ground. You can feel the heat when it goes over to take the cover off to go down and get the vegetables. You can feel the heat coming up in your face. Potatoes and the onion. Well I I picked the little seeds it's corns I picked it because I only got one row there, right? So that's gone before Season is up. Apples, you bag the apples and put them over. And carrots. Only thing down the cellar, the potatoes, if you leave them through the summer, they grow the, what they call the, the root stocks, because it's warm down there, see? It gets warm. It's not, well, I don't, it gets warm enough for it to grow, but it's cooler down there than it is up here, but it gets warm enough that uh, they start to grow their. That's their seed, eh? Everybody here back in, before my times, everybody was a gardener and a fisherman. They used to fish and do gardens. That was what they called the good days. <laughs> my nickname, Changwish. Everybody called me Changwish. I had just not too many people just Sagani shoulders, just white people, Elizabeth Panashwe. And the people she had you My parents come from Quebec. And she walk, come from Labrador. I was born in the bush, no doctor, no nurse. And I'm very I'm very proud and very ha happy when I stay in the tent. I was thinking this is I was born in the tent. I got the uh, seven sons and two daughters, nine all together, my own my own children. Nine. And my grandchildren fifty three all together. And my great great twenty four. My my dad when I was on always hunting, always. When I wake up in the morning sometimes my dad gone already hunting all day and my mom cook breakfast. We never eat in the bush in the country like a banana eggs like that. Never. My mom always cook fish or meat and bread. Bacon powder, mm -hmm. raisins and flour. Now I'm gonna put molasses. You know people when you when he cook we never never use measure. Never. When he want to make a fast cook, sometimes the kids, the small kids, uh, sometimes crying. He wants, he really want a bread. And my mom said, I gonna cook on the stove. Just make fast. You got to make a like this. Mm -hmm. Make a fast cook. It's not gonna be cook if you make. What you call? Hey, if you got a lot of children, you got to make a maybe three, just get enough next day. Maybe two days and then make another one. If you make today, you're not going to make a bread tomorrow. 
And the next day you got to make a braid again. I oh, wish my mom people he cut the he cut the braid. I oh, wish make a cross before he cut. Like women teach the girls, men teach the boys. Like uh, me when I was young, I always, I always, I help my mom. Sometimes I walk looking for partridge, for some sneers, sometimes porcupine. And the men hunting far, far away all, all day, come home at night. Only when he needs the. Um, when he needs flour, baking powder, salt, sugar and milk, tea bakes, he would walk. Sometimes 10 days, sometimes 15 days. And then you make money a little bit. And then you buy some food, flour, everything. Maybe just two, two days or one night, get ready to go back because you worry about his wife and babies and kids. He need the food. Mm -hmm. We got some lots of meat, but we need flour and everything like that, sugar, milk. When a small babies, very small babies, is no milk, and then he pressed pressed the babies. Mm -hmm. And uh, mothers, she gotta be good eat. Uh, when you cook a uh, fish in that water, you got put in there and then drink, and then the baby. And then that's why, you know, people, not too many people sick a long time. No all kind of problem. Cancer, diabetes, kidneys problem, high blood pressure. We didn't have that. And babies born in the bush in the country. Not too many food anymore. Not enough. It was a good fish to eat and all kind of meat. Now people buy in the store, pork chop, bononi eggs it's not the same you know people always eat country food it's almost 20 years now i'm doing work and canoe trip if i stop everything who's going to teach the children a lot of children J.I.G. the children very change when he go in the bush you know what you mean and then change again after when he came back too much uh, drugs and alcohol Every time when I go to meet in the country, I teach him. Like I teach my grandchildren. When she's grown up, when he married, and then she's gonna teach her children. Mm -hmm. I always pass, pass. And then I said, um, don't ever, ever forget what I teach you is very, very important for us, our culture. Still living in Portoslav. Came from a very large family. We had to cook to help our mother out. <laughs> she had that many children, so we were taught pretty young. <laughs> Every one of us can cook, I'd say, fairly good. I grew up, we all had to take turns making our special cake for the weekend. Each one's sisters, one did a, a light one, one did a chocolate one, and then we we did molasses, what they call the old fashioned molasses cake, or like a gingerbread. We learned the old way that they used to cook. Meat wasn't easy to come by back in them days, so there was no fridges, no electricity. The vegetables mainly came from our garden. Fish would have came from Port Spot. You go to the fishermen. I use my own olive oil. Now I'm gonna do a recipe that came back from great-grandmother from Quebec City. I'll keep stirring this now and have it brown, really brown. You brown your little bit of flour and make it nice and tasty. It was fish, you know, and a good potato and onions into it. I want some of the liquid to cook the fish, but I don't want too much. It was good. And we enjoyed it. Really did. My mom used to cook them. Oh, master size pot. The recipe did come from Quebec 
That's where my grandparents on my dad's side came from. My mom's side, my grandfather came right from France. At the age, probably 14, 15, he decided he was going to get off the boat, so he jumped ship and took the boat and rolled ashore into it and hid away under a pile of lumber. And the man that owned the land, he came out that morning, saw the men coming off the boat, he knew they were looking for someone. And he was hid away on his pile of lumber in the yard. So he took them in, gave them key, and then he took them, then showed them where to go, where no one wouldn't find them. Down in Eddie's Cove, there wasn't very many people, probably three or four families at that particular time. So they took him in, and that's where he met my grandma, my grandmother too, and he married her. It's just something when you decide you want some fish, you want fish stew or fried fish or whatever, you know, you just cook it up for a meal. It's always made the same way that my mom used to make it and taught us to make it. It was a recipe that we grew up loving. Thank you.